Welcome to Grounded. We are so excited to have you here with us as we study the topic of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and celebrate this Easter season. We're especially excited to be able to talk about the Book of Mormon and the scriptures within the Book of Mormon that bring us to Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about becoming new creatures in Christ as we focus on Jesus Christ and his atonement. And as we specifically share some experiences that we have had as we have learned to draw closer to Christ and take upon us his name. Welcome to Grounded where women of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds gather together with me, Barbara Morgan Gardner, and my guest, as we strive to build a bedrock understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and become more like Him. I'm so excited to have my wonderful friend and neighbor and ward member, Sharon Myler, with us today. Sharon, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled. Sharon, I, as you know, I consider you not only a, a dear friend, but a mentor. You're one that I see as one who understands the gospel. You've lived the gospel, um, and you have helped me understand the importance of being grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and allowing Christ himself to help us overcome and become what we need to become in this life. So, so thank you for your mentoring and your friendship, Sharon. Oh, thank you. So Sharon, President Nelson says that we are, in speaking of our identity, he says that we are all children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Christ. I love that he helps us understand our own identity in that manner. Beyond that, Sharon, how would you describe yourself and how would you help us to know a little bit more about you? Well, I think the best way for me to describe myself is someone who was compelled to be more of a feaster upon the word. I was more of a snacker, and um, that kind of pains me to have to say that, but I grew up in the 60s, and, you know, I was sort of that free dance major flower child. You were a flower child? Yes. <laughs> okay. Not not in the <laughs> fullest sense. Okay. I, I always lived the word of wisdom because I was a dancer, and, you know, you don't want to put things into your body. So I was really careful what I did, but yeah. I was a really free spirit. And I think um, that was my response to a very strict mm -hmm. environment was yeah. to, when I was out of the home, to just be kind of wild and crazy. <laughs> yeah. Probably living a little dangerously. Um, that's how I would describe my early self. And then I just became, um, through my trials, really familiar with my Savior because I reached out to him a lot and he became my best friend. Sharon, there's a, there's a statement by Oliver Wendell Holmes that reminds me a lot of you. He says this, for the simplicity that lies on this side of the complexity, I would not give a fig, but for the simplicity that lies on the other side of complexity, I would give my life. When I think of you, Sharon, I, I think of many wonderful things, but one thing I think of is you have as Nephi and Jacob and other prophets talk about, you have a simple, plain understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but not to be confused with ignorant mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. You you have a real understanding. You've gone through the complexity and your simplicity, as you just mentioned, Christ, your simplicity and your understanding of Christ comes because you have gone through the complexities of life. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm excited to have you, especially as we're talking about Easter and talking about the Savior and his resurrection and a new birth, things of that nature. I'm excited to be able to learn from you, be asking you some questions as we go along here as well. That's okay. Yes, I love it. To start out with Easter, the, the first presidency came out with a wonderful statement just, just in February of 2024. They said the following, this Easter season, we invite you to ponder the Savior's atoning sacrifice and glorious resurrection and glorious resurrection, which bless all of us. Through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, we receive this message of hope. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The Savior promises that as we keep his commandments and ordinances, we will have peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. We testify that Jesus Christ lives. He is risen. Because of him, we can be guided and strengthened as we bear the burdens we face in mortality. Through our faith in the Savior's atoning sacrifice, the bonds of sin cannot hold us and the trials that we experience in life will have no lasting power over us. The sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. So I, I love this statement, Sharon. And again, when I read this, I thought, Sharon is 
Sharon is a t living testament of exactly what they're testifying of. So I'm wondering, Sharon, will you help me and, and all of us who are listening to you today and part of this conversation, would you help us understand a little bit about this complexity that you've been through in your life and, and, and tie it into Easter and the hope and resurrection of Christ? Yes. At 26, I had my second child and she was born with severe multiple birth defects. Huh. And that was an attention getter for me that, um, in 1977, there were no programs for the disabled at all. Sharon, what do you mean by multiple birth defects? So what did that look like? Well, first of all, she was born with a cleft palate. That was our first indication that something was wrong and her umbilical cord wasn't formed right. And the doctors did say that most likely she would have other birth defects too. And surely enough, as she got older, um, they manifest themselves more and more, and she was very delayed. So she was mentally delayed and physically. We could tell early on that she had cerebral palsy. Okay. Wow. And, yeah. And um, it was challenging because at the birth of her, the doctors wanted me to place her in an institution, which they did in the 70s. Yeah. In the 60s, President Kennedy passed the bill that enabled all children to have education from five years on. Mm. And that was partly because his family was touched by that with a sister that had That's some right. problems. And so he made sure that was mandated, but then he left it up to the individual states to decide when they wanted to mandate services. And for Utah, we were kind of behind uh, some of the other bigger states and we didn't have early intervention services. So the easiest thing for doctors at that point were just to just ask us to place them because we didn't have much. When you say there. place them, what does that mean? So in Utah, it was here down in American Fork and it was a huge institution where they would just put these children that were born with disabilities in varying degrees. And um, Sharon, I think a lot of a lot of younger individuals are not familiar with that kind of facility. I, I mean, yeah. it, it seems almost a little bit strange to us to hear right. you would put a child somewhere and <laughs> move on with your life. I mean, well, what it was, was that? The status quo at the time because we mm -hmm. weren't equipped, and the mentality was that these individuals couldn't learn, and they were a drain on society, and so they just warehoused them basically. Wow. And I'm sure they were given some love and attention, sure. but I, I, I don't we think hope. it could be possibly as much as if they were kept in the home. Well, at the time that my daughter was born in the 70s, we were crossing kind of a new bridge. A group of parents had decided that we were going to try to keep them home. And there was a little early intervention program that had been started, but it was on a sliding fee scale. So we as parents had to pay money for this child to go. And it had some Title 20 monies that were put into it, but it was, it was for a very fortunate few. Yeah. And so I, I right then decided I was going to try and help Utah come along and jump on the bandwagon of modern day. Yeah. Thank you. And it took 10 years, but, um, we were able to get funding and, uh, programs mandated for early intervention. And it happened after my fourth child was born. So I had a third child who was born very healthy, beautiful, normal. And then our fourth baby was born with the same syndrome. And then we knew it was a syndrome. Yeah. She had had tests done where they did chromosomal studies and different things that were just very limited at that time in the seventies. So they said, go ahead and have more children. This is just a fluke. And with Jenny being born healthy and normal, I thought, oh, we're on a roll. I wanted eight children or more. And then my last one had that syndrome. So everything came to a screeching halt. Wow. As far as um, my, my normal life, because with two, it was very limiting, very limiting. And she had exactly the same things. However, she didn't have a cleft palate, hmm. just a cleft uvula. And so she was able to eat. With cleft palate babies, and especially in the 70s, we didn't know how to feed them. It was very hard to keep her alive. I just literally cut holes in the path, in the bottle and the nipple and just squirted milk wow. in her mouth. So 
you know, there were lots of learning curves back then for learning how to pioneer this new path. A complete, I, I, I can't imagine what kind of life-changing experience it would be. I mean, first of all, to start being a mom and having children, but, but then to have this recognition of what that's going to mean for your mm -hmm. future and knowing that you're such a person of an, an intense love and, and sincere love, you're, I would imagine, I mean, you, you let, you let us know, but I would imagine that that became your life. Oh, it did. It was all consuming. And I had two other children that yeah. I needed to be very aware of. So I would, um, do the programs that I, and, and by the way, I was in elementary education. I was privileged to study the Doman Delcato method of stimulation for mm. these children that are brain damaged. It was very very on the crust right then they they didn't have much information that you could stimulate their brains and help them to do wow. more and so i had taken that class so i was doing programs stimulating them and then running my little activities for matt and jenny and put jenny in dance and matt on teams and i put the girls in their wheelchairs and or at the time they were strollers that were buckled together because yeah. they were just infants and we'd go to their games and dances. And so I wanted I wanted everybody to have what they needed. And it was very taxing. But luckily, I had a lot of energy and yeah. I could do it. And then the Lord filled in where I couldn't. And he made up the difference. Wow. Sure. And so continue on with, with life a little bit. The, the, the children are, are growing up. They're going mm -hmm. through their teenage years. How was, mm -hmm. how was that experience? Well... When my girls with the syndrome, which is an unknown syndrome as of when they were born, maybe now there's something that's been discovered, but it, there was no projections of what I could expect when they got older. And I used to, in this early intervention program, I'd look at the children with Down syndrome and I'd think, gosh, I wish my girls had Down syndrome because they knew more about what yeah. to expect. But there was just nothing that they knew about this. So it was just really shooting in the dark. And when they became early on in their teenage years, they started seizuring because their bodies went through changes that brought on seizures. So that added a lot of extra frustration. Um, one of them did learn to walk a little bit. She could walk, my oldest. The other had to have a, a walker to walk and she would get very tired. So. We still resorted to wheelchairs wherever we went. And you lifting her and helping her, feeding her, all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah, sure. And they, they couldn't feed themselves very well. Um, most people that have been around cerebral palsy children have noticed that some move all the time. They'll, they just do this self-stimulation or maybe it's a, a response they can't control where they're shaking their heads. And so my youngest one had that and it was really hard to feed her it was like trying to hit a moving target wow I, I yeah. okay so you're going through older you don't know what their future is for these for your beautiful daughters that you're trying mm -hmm. to help you have these other other two children that you're trying to mm -hmm. provide this life that, that yes that you would expect and that they were probably hoping for so so continue to walk through maybe even young adult years and also Sharon I'm wondering how what is your testimony like at this point? I mean, you <laughs> talked about how you were snacking yes. before, but there's mm -hmm. there's this stretching period of oh, time, gosh. and this this isn't a day. This is years. Oh yes. So what's yes. happening to you in, in that well, stage? Well, one of the most profound things that happened was when Matthew, my oldest, was probably close to seven, and Becky having the syndrome was about five, and Jenny was about three. And by the way, she was a screaming child. She just turned out to be the most beautiful person, but she screamed. Yeah. She was just one of those kids. I think she had, you know, probably colic, 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 yeah, yeah. and um, just was uncomfortable. And then as she got a little older, she just wanted her way. So she was a screamer, and it upset the other two children. I bet. That's so hard. It was really funny trying to, well, that. Um, but I also, as the kids got older, I wanted their friends to be, come over, and I wanted to expose the world to these beautiful spirits that we had in our home yeah. that were in these little imperfect shells because I wanted children to start growing up. And that's something I fought for in the legislature was um, having children allowed to go to their own neighborhood schools when they became school age huh. because the children needed to have this 
time where they understood these sure. sort of special yeah. needs children instead of having them placed in an institution. Yeah. So I fought really hard for that. And we had what we call peer tutoring, which is still happening in the schools. My children became peer tutors at school and all the kids in the ward would go on to be peer tutors because they weren't nervous about yeah. it. They'd grown up with these kids in the neighborhood. So that was That's a beautiful. huge bonus. Yep. But the biggest thing that happened that changed my attitude was I was feeling rather sorry for myself at this point where Matt was about seven, Becky five, Jenny three, the screamer. So I know I turned something on and I said, Matt, you're going to have to watch these girls. Mom needs a little moment. I've got to go upstairs and just give me a few minutes. And I went up there and just collapsed to my knees. And I, I just had felt for three weeks, months, I'd felt so discouraged. And I thought, and my, by the way, <laughs> my husband wasn't home a lot because yeah. we were starting our business. And so he was in either in Ogden or in Salt Lake, trying to get this off the ground. And I was going it alone. He he really wasn't an at-home person. And, yeah. and then he was also a bishop or in a bishopric or in the stake. He was gone. And I felt like I needed the Lord to help me understand what good was going to come from this, number one, because I was feeling grumpy. Sure. And, and testy. And how was I going to deal with it? And, and I got pretty low at times where I thought, can I go on? You know, and that's scary when you think, can I really go on? What, what's the option? All right. You know, you have to go on. So I think it was just that time that I was so discouraged that opened up the windows of heaven for me. And I literally felt angels in my room. I felt arms around my shoulders. And I think it was the Savior comforting me. I'd like to think that, and I felt directed to open my scriptures, and they literally fell open to D&C 122, verses 7 and 8. Can I open that? Mm -hmm. All right, 122. If, if it's okay, let's use these scriptures, and would you mind reading this for mm -hmm. us? Yes. So D&C, section 122, verses 6 and 7, but I will read 7 just because that's the one that really, 7 and 8, actually. And if thou shouldst be cast in the pit or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee, if thou shalt be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, and if the heavens gather blackness, and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. When my eyes fell to that, I absolutely felt that the Lord was saying, Sharon, this is Joseph Smith pleading for help. He's in the, in jail, yeah, in Liberty Jail and a dungeon and they're suffering and the saints are suffering and he's pleading for deliverance. And Here's me, just little old me, saying, I need help. And I was delivered to this very passage to bring me out of my, because I felt like the Lord was saying, buck up, Joseph. And yeah. by my reading that, it was, buck up, Sharon. You can do it. And not only am I going to help you do it, but you're going to help others do it too. And I realized that was, part of that message was delivered to me to take what I learned to share my testimony and to make that world better for these people that are born with disabilities, at least in Utah. So Sharon, thank you. I, I, this has always been one of my all-time favorite scriptures, and I appreciate that you're tying us into Christ here. And, and that's one of the things I, I really want to just ask you here. If, if you could tell us what, what happened to your, to your children, what, what has been your experience as they have been adults that has helped you also tie into Christ and tie it into the Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So maybe jump ahead for us yeah. here a little bit. Okay. Like I say, I, I took the girls everywhere. So we always attended church and I was young women's president three different times in three different wards because of boundary changes and so forth. And I would just haul them with me and we didn't have an elevator in our building. So I had to have them walk down the stairs or I'd carry them wow. into the young women's room 
and the young women were beautiful with them. Most of them would come and help me during the week at times when I needed help. So my girls grew up knowing church. From the time they were tiny, they recognized the Savior, which I think is interesting. Yeah, it is. So we were gathered together on the couch. My caregiver, who was about to leave on a mission, and my two children, and Becky and Katie, my other two children that had the syndrome. And I was saying to the caregiver, oh, you're going to love your mission. You are going to eat, sleep, think, drink the gospel because you're really not allowed to have newspapers. Of course, we didn't have cell phones back then. TV, you're going to be saturated with the gospel and you will be so in tune with the things of the spirit. And as I said that, Becky, who was probably about 16 at the time, got up from the couch, walked over to our picture of the Savior and was touching the oh, picture wow. and crying. And she walked with great difficulty to get there, but yeah. she wanted us to know she knew her Savior. And she was shedding tears, and we were shedding tears, and it was a beautiful moment. So um, they had a lot of experience with the church and, and loving what they heard. And I did, never knew how much they could understand because the doctors would say, oh, they're probably on about a two-year-old level. But they certainly were on a higher level when it came to spiritual things. They really understood it. Sharon, as, as you continued on, I know so your story, and maybe you could tell us and just tie this specifically into now uh, what what happened to your daughters, what happened mm -hmm. to your, your young family, and yes. tying that into to the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Easter. Yes. Well, uh, in 2006, when Katie was 24, she had a seizure and she was eating and unfortunately she aspirated on her food and died. And um, they kept her alive. They were able to restart her heart and we had her on life support for about a week because it was so hard to let her go. I just kept thinking, Katie, you're such a fighter. But during that time, I had a very interesting experience as she was laying there and every day they would say, it's more evident that she's had more and more yeah. brain damage. I was walking through a hallway and windows of light were coming into the hallway. And when I taught children's dance, I taught for the School of Ballet West, um, I would have the children went, run to the windows of light from the, this beautiful studio where yeah. we were. And I say, get on your window of light and let's dance. And as I walked through this hallway in the hospital, I heard the Lord say to me, Sharon, Katie's on her window of, for dancing, let her go. She's in her window of light. Oh, wow. And so that made it easier for me to let her go. And then six years later, one morning, Becky started crying and I could not comfort her. And she's my other disabled daughter. And, and by now, my other two children were married. Sure. Yep. And um, they had each had four children. Well, when Becky was crying, I tried to comfort her. And I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I think um, that she had had a messenger let her know that later that day, her sister was going to pass away. And Jenny was killed in a motorcycle accident that very afternoon. And so I feel like- Jenny was your daughter that, that didn't have the disabilities, right, right? She was on vacation in Hawaii with her husband. And unfortunately they had a very terrible accident and he was, he lived, thank goodness. But Jenny was killed instantly, and I think some messenger let mm. Becky know that her sister was going today, and that's why she was crying. Wow. We could not comfort her. We couldn't understand it, but then at the end of the day, I looked at her when I got the phone call, and I said, Becky, you knew Jenny was going today, and she just looked at me with the most intent, intelligent eyes that, yes, Mom, we knew. So she had lost two sisters mm -hmm. at this point. You had lost two daughters. Yes. Ten months later, John started to die of cancer. And John yep. is your husband? Uh -huh. And he died 20 months after Jenny died. And I was absolutely, I just kept thinking, no, the Lord's not going to take him to. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe that was going to happen. And um, we prayed fervently. We fought it valiantly. He fought so hard that when we went to MD Anderson, they said, we don't understand why you're alive. And he kept thinking he was going to get the miracle. But he didn't. But the miracle was what happened to me and probably what happened in the spirit world yeah. to my other family that was gone and what's happened to my grandchildren as 
we've been able to bear witness of these spiritual things, it's brought us all to a different level. And um, after John died, my mother died two weeks later in my home. So I was really tried. And I was led to read a lot of different things. And in my reading, I read a statement by Neil Maxwell where he said that there are billions of souls that have departed this life that are waiting to hear the gospel. And there are there's a great need for missionaries in the spirit world. And when we have the early release of one of our loved ones, where it really doesn't make sense why yeah. they had to go early. And Jenny had four children she left behind. The youngest was two. The oldest was 10. It was wow. hard for me to wrap my mind around that. But when I read that by Neil Maxwell, he said, those souls will be so touched and affected by their testimonies and what they teach that when we get to the spirit world, they will rush to us and thank us for gracefully accepting the early release of our family member or loved one that died. Wow. That is beautiful. Yeah, it changed my whole I bet it attitude. Did. When you recognize that there is there's a grander, a greater plan than all of this. Yes. And it's Sharon, if I remember right, you correct me, I believe that you lost one more daughter. Well, yes, Becky died um, six years after Jenny. So every six years I buried a daughter. So in 2018, Becky died and I felt that she had a little breakdown after her sisters and her dad passed away that she understood and she willed herself to just go. She was 38 at the time I placed her and I had to place her because I couldn't take care of her anymore. I was alone. Yeah. We'd fall down the stairs together with a seizure and I'd lay at the bottom of the stairs thinking, I've got to get up. And finally I heard the Lord say, Sharon, it's time. Oh, and so goodness. I placed her her last two years and then she passed away in 2018. Sure. Sharon, I have, I've heard you talk about this story before. And one of the questions I've asked you before, and I'm going to ask it, but I'm going to do it in context of a couple of scriptures here, because I know that this is something that you have talked about in second Nephi chapter nine, uh, verses six through 15. And then again, 22, Jacob is teaching us about the resurrection. One of the beautiful things, one of the beautiful teachings of the book of Mormon is it teaches us even more regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And these prophets are just testifying and testifying. Jacob has a great testimony of, of the resurrection. I just want to read a couple of things, and you're talking about this plan. He says, For as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator, there must needs be a power of resurrection. And the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall. And the fall came by reason of transgression, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Then he continues, Wherefore, it must needs be an infinite atonement, save it she be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgments which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration. And then he says in verse 8, oh the, wisdom and of, oh, the wisdom of God and his mercy and his grace. And then in verse 10, he says, Oh, how great the goodness of our God. And then in verse 13, Oh, how great the plan of our God. And then specifically he talks about, in verse 13, that the grave will deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit and the body is restored to itself again, and all men become uncorrupt, incorruptible and immortal, and they are living souls, having perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfected. There are other places in the scriptures that I love in the Book of Mormon. Alma chapter 11 is one of my all-time favorites on the resurrection, 42 through 45 specifically. Alma chapter 40, verses 23 through 25. For time's sake, we're not going to go there, but mm -hmm. but just for those listening especially and for us just to remember, 3 Nephi chapter 26 is another great, great scripture on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love that Mary Magdalene was the first person, this woman, to see the resurrected Savior. I just, mm -hmm. I love that in the scriptures. But I want to ask you, you've lost three children. You lost your husband. You lost your mother at the very same period of time. For many of us, Sharon, I think that we may feel like that's just too much, or we may feel like that God does not know us, or his plan must not be perfect, or how could this happen to me? And this could be a breaking point. So my question for you is, in this Easter season especially, how, how have you made it through? How have you really, how are you able to get up in the morning, and how are you able to continue on with your life? Honestly, Barb, it isn't, it isn't 
by any other means except for my Savior and the love that I felt from him. And I feel from him every day, and I commune with him every morning. Um, I just really had a complete turning of heart and a complete conversion. I became a new person when probably that day that he, he spoke to me in so many different ways. I mean, for someone who hadn't been a very good seminary student to open the scriptures, angels turned my scriptures to D&C 122. Yeah. I needed to read that. And I felt angels in the room. So I'm not going to backpedal at all and forget what happened to me. That was life-changing because I wanted it. I wanted an answer. I wanted to know what good would come from this and how was I going to do it. And I was shown. And I'm just so grateful. And I'm shown all the time when everybody died. I had the missionaries live in my basement. So, And I was working in the temple. And um, I'd ask the missionaries to give me a priesthood blessing every time I felt frightened. And it would quell my fears. And so that priesthood, I have, you know, yeah. I have oh, a yeah. very strong testimony of the priesthood. Sharon, thank you so much for discussing uh, these these experiences that you've had in your life. I've loved being able to go into the Book of Mormon as we talked about and really discuss the principles and the doctrines of the Book of Mormon that are found in the Book of Mormon in regards to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our experiences. Let's now switch, if this is okay with you, and let's talk about becoming new creatures through the atonement of Christ as we talk, continue to talk about this Easter season. Is that okay with you? Yes. Okay, Love let's it. do it. In Mosiah chapter 5, it's one of my favorite scriptures on this topic. We have King Benjamin talking to his people mm -hmm. about becoming new. And for me, it is, you just talk, mentioned going to the temple. It is such a temple chapter. And we have, we have King Benjamin, and you notice in this chapter, and I will let those of you who are watching this at home or listening to this at home, I will let you study covenants and new and name and all that's associated. But I just want to point out verse five. He says, and we are willing to enter into a covenant with God to do his will and be obedient to his commandments in all things. Then in verse six, he says, I desire, he, he says, and the covenants which I have made is a righteous covenant. Verse seven, and now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ. So this you're talking about this relationship that you're building with Christ. Mm -hmm. It is actually a term, scriptural term that we become children of Christ, this relationship with him, where he says, for behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. For ye, for ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. This idea of when we take the sacrament and we enter into a covenant mm -hmm. with the Lord, we, we testify a few things, but one is that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ. When we go to the temple and make sacred covenants with the Lord, we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. I love this statement by, by President Nelson. Um, he says this, and he's talking about going into the temple and the profoundness of the temple. When, 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 we, when we enter the temple and receive the garment of the holy priesthood, which you just talked about the priesthood, we are taking upon us symbolically in the garment, we're taking upon us the name of Jesus Christ. And President Nelson says this, your garment is symbolic of the veil of the temple. The veil is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you put on your garment, you may feel that you are truly putting upon yourself the very sacred symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. His life, his ministry, his mission, which was to atone for every daughter and son of God. I, I love this idea of when we celebrate Easter that we're celebrating Christ's atonement. When we're celebrating Easter, we're celebrating the newness of making covenants and us becoming a new creature with Christ, us taking upon us his name, as Alma talks about, us becoming reborn through mm -hmm. Christ, and us helping other people then take upon them their name, his, his name, in a variety of ways. Elder Haney has a, had a BYU devotional, and he said this, I witness that God is eager to enter into a covenant relationship with us in his temple. One that will, as President Nelson has testified, change our relationship with him forever and bless us with an extra measure of his love and mercy. When I think of your story of, of your children and the love that you had for your children and your husband and your mother, I think of this, this increase of capacity that has come mm -hmm. to you because you have made and kept sacred covenants with God. So I want to ask you this question then as we're talking about 
Christ, how have you been reborn by coming to know the Savior through your trials? Well, as I said, I just feel like I, I emerged a new person, but not only from that experience, but every week, every year. And, you know, they were not, they didn't function normally in any way. And I remember standing them before the mirror in the bathroom and just looking in that mirror and saying to myself, will this ever come to an end? Because it felt so difficult. But then I would just feel kind of infused with this joyful feeling like I'm going to make it. They're, they're great. They're going to be okay. And because I understood about the atonement and, and I just love the Savior, he felt like a friend. He still feels like a friend. And he didn't, you know, it just didn't seem difficult anymore. It just, it was natural for me to just cling to him. I love wearing my garments. I love the, the covenants that I've made in the temple. And I just think it was just that I was reborn. On a personal note, Sherrod, I remember when my oldest came home from Sunday school and you were her Sunday school teacher and she had just come into our family and she was new to the neighborhood. She was new to the ward. She was new to school. She was new to our home. She was new to our family. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was a very, very difficult time for a little girl. Yes. And I remember her coming in and saying to me, mom, I have this teacher. Her name is sister Myler. Did you know that she knows what it's like to lose everything like I have? Oh, oh! it was the most beautiful. You, I couldn't thank you enough for that. I mean, who else could I have <laughs> to right. teach my little, my little child who we were just getting to know, frankly, that you can rely on Jesus Christ, that you can continue with your path, that you can have a happy life to a child who was literally despondent and going through a complete change of lifestyle yes. to have a teacher in primary testify to her that everything was going to be okay through Jesus Christ, that there was a reason and there was a purpose for her future and that she could depend on Jesus Christ and become a new person because of him, because you had done it. I mean, she, and she just talked about, you're just the hug that you gave her and the love that you gave her. She yeah. had such a real experience. It was a life changer for her and, and a blessing for our entire family because you were willing, Sharon, to pay the price to keep going. You were willing to be grounded and you were willing to follow Jesus Christ and not give up. And because and, of that, you, you're saving my little family. Well, and I was willing to find a new life. Yes. That's what a lot of people don't understand is the Lord wants you to go on and to have purpose and joy. And I just wanted those little primary children to know here I am. I'm your primary teacher and I'm happy to be here. And I've got a new husband and I have new children and the Lord has blessed me. He led me to that family because I wanted to find them. I remember even Allie talking about mom and guess what? She even has a, she even has a, a different name, a new name, <laughs> right? I mean, and for her, that was a big deal. I mean, yeah. she was coming into a whole new situation yes. with a new family, new name which ties again into the Savior. When we are taking upon us his name, mm -hmm. a new name, we become his family. We, we become literally covenant children of God and we take upon us his name and we are new creatures in Christ, possible yes. through the resurrection. Yes. This Easter season that we celebrate. Such a beautiful time. It is. Sharon, I can't thank you enough. I, I, I have a, a, a short invitation from President Nelson that I'd like to read. Uh, he says this. After all that Jesus Christ did for you, I invite you to do something this week to follow his teachings. You might make your prayers more earnest. You could forgive someone or help a friend in need. You can start today on a new spiritual quest, which is what you are exactly describing. And then he testifies of this. President Nelson says, Jesus Christ lives. As our resurrected and atoning Savior, he stands ready to help us grow from the dramatic, unexpected events in our lives. At this Easter season, he continues, let us worship and praise him for the peace, hope, light, and truth he brings to us. So Sharon, I, I appreciate so much the story that you have shared with us, and I appreciate especially your willingness 
to go to this to, to go to our Father in heaven in prayer, to rely upon Jesus Christ, and to continue on this covenant path where you have clearly taken upon yourself his name, been been born again through him, and also following his invitation to then reach out to other people and help them on this covenant path. There are children like my own, and all of us need it, as you know, we desperately need people like you who will not let go of the Savior. So Can thank I you for that example. Something? Please. On the resurrection, a great hope that I have and a knowledge that I have is that my girls are in their spirit, beautiful forms now. They're dancing in the light. And, you know, they 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 shed those shells just like we all will. Sure, and there, you just brought me into an important scripture. It's Alma chapter 11, verse 41 and, and 42 and 43. I'll start in verse 42. Now there is a death in which is called a temporal death. And the death of Christ shall loose the bands of this temporal death, and all shall be raised from this temporal death. <laughs> the spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we now are at this time, and we shall be brought to stand before God, knowing even as we know now and have a bright recollection of all of our guilt. And now he says, and this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female. And then he says, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame as it is now. And then finishing, um, he says, or in the body and shall be brought, be, be arraigned before the bar of, of Christ, the son of God and God, the father and the Holy spirit, which is one eternal God to be judged according to their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. I, I, I testify as well as you just said, I know that those that I have lost, I've lost, you know, I've lost my parents. I've lost many that I, I love dearly. I cannot wait for the moment to see them in their perfected form. I, I, I am, I've seen the turmoil of, of mortality. I've seen that I've seen the struggles of, of bodies, um, being prepared to pass beyond the grave. But I, I know as, as you know, the beauty that's going to be there when we are able to see and be with each other and recognize their perfected bodies at that time. That's real for us. It is. It is what has fueled me to go forward. Sharon, as we as we finish off, there's a question I ask often, I uh, ask every time, frankly, it's, it's President Packer, and he talks about the therefore what. So as we teach the scriptures, as we study, as we learn, that, that we can ask ourselves the question, therefore what? So with this discussion that we've had using our scriptures and this beautiful experience and story that you have, what's your therefore what, Sharon? Well, I think my favorite thought always is, and I tell this to my family and my granddaughters that are in their early 20s, there's a lot that the world throws at you. It's kind of like running a gauntlet. If you've ever read about gauntlets, you're going to have a lot of things thrown and even things sometimes that maybe you don't understand in the gospel as you run through that gauntlet but just keep your eyes on the savior he's at the end of that gauntlet and he wants to embrace you and the other stuff doesn't matter just keep your eyes on the savior and love him because he loves you so much and that is what grounds me Sharon, that reminds me of President Nelson just telling us to keep our eyes riveted on the Savior and that the power really does come as we keep our covenants with him, that his resurrection is real, that he is the source of all power. He's the source of the power that allows us to, to, to continue to fortify ourselves uh, through Jesus Christ. He's the power that helps you continue to move on in these difficult times. He's also the power behind the resurrection. He's the power that makes it, makes it possible. It's, our covenants don't save us. Christ saves us. The atonement doesn't save us. Christ saves us. It is it is Christ that allows for all this to happen. It's him that we are grateful for at this Easter season. It's his resurrection that we are celebrating. It's his life that we are celebrating as well. So Sharon, th thank you so much. Thank you for the reminder to keep our eyes riveted on the Savior and to really keep our focus on him. We would, we would like to thank you all for joining with us today as we are all working together to keep our eyes riveted on the Savior. President Nelson has given all of us that wonderful invitation to focus on the Savior during this Easter season. We invite you to think of your own therefore what, how you are going to apply the scriptures, especially in regards to these, these Easter scriptures this season. And we invite you to act upon those things that you are learning. 
We also invite you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. We invite you to share this podcast with others so that together we can be grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and gather together and gather together as children of Christ as we come unto him and take upon ourselves his name. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much.